What was it like in 1673 when New York became New Orleans and then again became New York City? I mean, how much of like na 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 was going on during that time? And as a native New Yorker who went to public schools here, I never even knew about the second switchover and then the third switchover until I read uh, Russell Shorto's book. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, period of time and needs to be uh, written about more. Uh, historians, uh, even historians who know better, jump from 1664 into the 18th century and leave the reconquest or the restoration, as we like to call it, the restoration of New Netherland out those 14 months because it was only just a short period of time and sometimes they make you think that it was just a matter of hours that the Dutch word <laughs> retook New York. It's 14 months. They, re, they uh, retook control of every uh, location in New Netherlands uh, with the exception of uh, uh, Svanendal or Lewis, uh, which we, uh, I won't go into, it was sort of a nasty business with the, uh, with the English coming over from Maryland. But um, uh, they, uh, when, the, when the English, when the Dutch appeared in the harbor, uh, the settlers or the, the residents of New York, the Dutch residents, took their arms and circled the fort. And they shouted up to the soldiers, keep your heads down or we'll blow them off. That shows you how much they wanted to be under the English crown. I, I was told once by a guide on Lower Manhattan that the Dutch were so, uh, so happy that when the English came in in 1664 because now they were under the English crown. And uh, <laughs> uh, this is nine years later and they're still uh, very Dutch. And uh, um, it, it's, a, it's an important period of time and probably the most uh, important thing to come out of this was the ease in which the Dutch retook control uh, when they uh, negotiate uh, New Netherland back to the English at the end of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, the Treaty of Westminster. Uh, the English decide uh, to uh, take, take a firmer hand in New York. They were more occupied with uh, New England settlers uh, in that first period of time, those nine years after, after the first takeover. Uh, there was a lot of dissension in East Chester, for example, and on Long Island. They more or less let the Dutch do what they wanted. But the, when they came back again, they, uh, they instituted the very strict uh, laws and uh, the jury system and, and so forth. We should, of course, be careful not to I've already said this before, but not to project 19th century ideas about nationalism into the 17th century. The primary concern of the 17th century is the local community and religion is important. Language is also important, but not as much. But loyalty in the way that we know it to a flag or to a government, that's not the case. A takeover would be like the election of a government that you didn't vote for. It's annoying, you don't like it, but it's not a reason to revolt. If you take it in those terms, it becomes a little easier to understand why the Dutch didn't really protest that much against the English takeover in 64. If somebody walks in with, with 300 soldiers, what can you do? Government comes from God. God has decided that we will be under the English. And that's an exact quote, actually, from the 1665. Jeremias says this. So it's to describe these events in 19th century terms, as has been done and as has been repeated in the 20th century, is to distort and really project national sentiments of the 19th century into the 17th century, and in which they really have no place. And another, and another thing you have to consider is when the, when the English uh, took the colony in 1664, first of all, it was a surprise attack. There, there was no war at that time. War wasn't declared until the next uh, spring. Um, but it was thought by the Dutch that this was just a temporary matter that as soon as the war, which was then declared, the Second 
Anglo-Dutch war ended that it would be negotiated back to the Dutch. In fact, the Dutch even tried to retake it uh, through de Ruyter, through his uh, uh, expedition in 1665. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's not exactly the way uh, it's represented in history that uh, this was a fait accompli that the, the, the English took over in 1664 and then um, uh, 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 it was going to remain English. That was the end of it. When the uh, English took over, is it true that the women of Amsterdam lost some of the, uh, because of the differences in the cultures, that women lost some of the freedoms that they had under the Dutch in terms of what they could own and uh, what powers their husbands had over them? Uh, only very gradually. What we do see uh, is a gradual development towards the uh, away from the mutual will that the Dutch had, and there is there is definitely a cultural influence there, but it only really takes over after about 1700. We must keep in mind, of course, that the Dutch remained an ethnic majority in New York City until the 1730s almost, and in Albany, the Dutch, well, Albany remained for all practical purposes, a Dutch city until almost until the revolution. So it's, but what we do see in the legal system is gradual changes. We also see some changes actually to the English legal system. The position of the prosecutor, for instance, the schout, which is a, a more of a, of a Dutch thing. The, uh, the schout both investigates and prosecutes, and that's, that is a different situation from the English practice. The uh, treaty that ended the Third War, uh, in which um, New York did not um, stay with the Dutch, but was, I guess, negotiated back to the English. What, what were the considerations in, you know, in Amsterdam, in Netherlands, uh, you know, what were the trade-offs? What, what were they interested in getting from the English that they were prepared to let New York go? Basically, what we have at the end of the Second Anglo-Dutch War and the Third Anglo-Dutch War are two different ways of ending a war. Um, these were not requests for unconditional surrender or something like that. The two ways to do it were either return all territories to the original owner or at the point where you make peace, everybody keeps the same thing. What happens is that which option is chosen, chosen depends on the actual balance of power at the moment. Specific considerations as to Im the importance of one colony or another, Suriname or the Netherlands, doesn't really come into it. It's simply this is the way these two options are available and you make a couple of small changes here and there and you pay recompensation for this and you agree to not uh, uh, trying to evade the uh, acts of navigation anymore. But it's relatively minor. The two main ways are either you keep it the same, you keep what you've got, or you return what you gained. Those are the two ways of doing it. it, it there was not really a discussion about New Netherland as such. In the second, in the third Anglo-Dutch war, the Dutch, after the Rampjaar, as we call it, was not just at war with England, but also with France and with parts of the German states. To make peace with one of those parties was very important as it freed up forces to continue fighting the French who had occupied a large part of the Dutch Republic at the time. If you have already lost half of your country to the French, then a small colony on the other side of the world is, I'm afraid, not of importance.